Hey all, Scott here. I don't know why it's taken me this long to start committing witchcraft, but here we are. I'm gonna try and look into the future and find out what all the E3 press conferences are gonna be like. Well, that ruined the surprise. I can smell virginity and Todd Howard swearing in the air, so it must mean E3 2019's here, my favorite E3 of 2019. Going into it, this was an interesting show based on how uninteresting it seemingly was. You know, press conferences from Sony and EA. Now, it wouldn't be E3 without EA boring people, so they did have a presence in the form of their own event a couple of days before E3 as usual, but Sony was completely absent. So that left Microsoft, Nintendo, and Google f***ing Stadia to pick up the slag. This is a bad sign. As per usual, I'll be taking a look at each of the major showcases from this E3 and rating them on a scale of 1 to 5 knee slaps, starting things off with Google's Stadia Connect on June 6th. Yeah, this really wasn't a part of E3, but we didn't have Sony showing us Spider-Man during the press conference for the fourth time this year, so might as well talk about this. So Google Stadia is the hip new thing to not care about, a streaming platform for games that's been the dream for almost a decade now for a lot of companies. Being able to connect to the internet and play top of the line games stream to your device. You don't need any big fancy hardware. They use the big fancy hardware themselves and stream the experience to you. It's something from what I've experienced, works fine, but not fine enough to fully replace standard consoles. But if there's anybody who can make game streaming popular and work well, it's probably Google. So let's see what they have in store for us. Anybody ever wonder what the side of Phil Harrison looks like? Thank you! Phil Harrison stands in purgatory while letting us know Stadia Connect is going to be their platform to deliver all the news about Google Stadia. Yes, they're ripping off State of Play. So yeah, we can play games with no console required. All we need is a Chromecast, laptop, tablet, or phone, and internet connection. The first wave of games available via Google Stadia is about to be unveiled, but first it's Baldur's Gate 3, everybody! Think about the game series I have the least affinity for. Baldur's Gate is right after it, I know nothing about this series, but I do know this game has been a long time coming and it's great to see it finally come to fruition, weird foot stuff and all. We can't wait for you to play Baldur's Gate 3 on Stadia. No, on PC you can f*** right off. Alright, so we get some internet speed requirements for Stadia. Now, honestly, not that bad. Of course, the quality gets worse the slower your internet speeds are, but as long as it runs smoothly and only the resolution takes a slight hit, that's okay. This guy talks about the sheer speed of Google Stadia like it's faster than a car or something. That's perfect for fighting games like Mortal Kombat. Finally, I can play Mortal Kombat 11 with Google Chrome. That was why I didn't buy the game originally. All right, so what do I need to use Google Stadia? Well, no integrity for one. The main thing you'll need is a controller. The Stadia controller is shown off here and honestly looks like a fairly standard controller. It looks comfortable enough. But you can use a bunch of different types of controllers instead if you want to. Xbox One, PS4, or even just keyboard and mouse. All right, we're finally ready to play Stadia. The only other thing you need is a screen to play on. <laughs> if you'd rather play on your laptop, desktop or tablet. Why was the desktop smaller than the laptop? So the dream for Google is to have Stadia run on anything with Chrome installed on it. What a bold dream. And now we finally get some game showcased. Oh sh yeah, it's a game platform. Ghost Recon Breakpoint. I'm sorry, but most of the Tom Clancy game trailers just kind of blend together for me. So watching this trailer was the longest I ever held this expression. Guild's a horror game made by the guys who made Rhyme. It looks sort of interesting. I like the character design. It reminds me of Psychonauts, but also these sort of horror themes games like Limbo or Inside give off, where yeah, it can be gruesome, but hey, cartoony character designs and art. Apparently this is just a Google Stadia game at the moment, so we'll give one point to Stadia for one exclusive. Things might start to heat up here. Get packed. This is a multiplayer game like Overcooked, but you're moving things. They're not joking around. Tom Clancy's The Division 2. Yes, more Tom Clancy, just what Stadia needs. I don't really understand why they're talking about The Division 2 as if it's not out yet. It came out in March. They're saying stuff like, oh, we learned so much from the first game when designing Division 2 and talking about the setting of the game. And it's like, that's the stuff you say before the game comes out. We know all of this. Just show that Division 2 is coming to Stadia and move on. That's a look at just some of the amazing titles we're bringing to you at launch. What? If those are the main top of the line cream of the crop games are showing off for Stadia, we're in trouble. So on to how much it'll cost. There's an optional subscription model, Stadia Pro. 10 bucks a month for the best streaming quality, you get select games for free and discounts on some titles. Kind of like the Stadia version of PlayStation Plus or something, but you can just use Stadia in 2020 for free. You can just buy the games you want and play them with your internet connection, no extra subscription fee or anything. The Stadia Founders Edition is some collector's first release version of Stadia. You get a Chromecast, a controller, and three months of Stadia Pro. You can also pick up an additional Stadia controller for $69. 
Why the hell are controllers so expensive now? Oh, it's all worth it. I get Destiny 2 for free with Stadia Pro. Destiny 2, a $7 value for free. Yeah, you get all the expansions with it on Stadia, but I don't care. I just like bringing up the fact that Destiny 2 is seven bucks now. Once again, they go through a long video about Destiny 2, a game that's been out for two years. This isn't selling me on Stadia. There's the reveal of the expansion Shadow Keep. All right, okay, cool, great. So the Stadia Founders Edition is $129 with all this. Honestly, not a terrible price. We're at the end now and get a big mod of all the other games coming to Stadia. Whoa, 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 whoa! It's thank you for flashing all those logos by. I have no idea what's coming to Stadia that was so fast. So a good chunk of games are coming and a lot of them are good stuff. Doom, the Tomb Raider games, Borderlands 3. But a lot of these are things already available on other platforms. It gives me flashbacks of the problem with third party support on the Wii U. Oh uh, yeah, the Switch primarily has old games and it's succeeding hard, but you can play them all portably. That's a big plus for a lot of people. It's a good reason to buy these old games. With the Wii U, you could play Mass Effect 3 on it like six months after everybody else. That wasn't really an exciting game to play at the time. Now, you could play it off the TV on the Wii U gamepad, which was nice, but you were required to be nearby the Wii U console. Kind of like how Stadia requires you to have an internet connection. So I'm fine with Google Stadia. I don't know if it's gonna be a huge hit or anything. I think it'll work well, but none of the games shown are compelling to buy on Stadia for me. I own all the consoles these things will appear on or are already on. I mean, it's kind of cool that since this is all streaming based, you really never have to buy a new video game console, but was buying a new video game console every seven years really a huge issue? You'd be spending 120 bucks a year to use Stadia Pro anyway, so the positives of Stadia compared to standard consoles aren't really speaking to me. The idea of picking up a game I was playing on my laptop right where I left off on my phone is novel as well, but I just don't see myself doing it very often. Streaming a game from my phone on LTE will fry my battery life and eat up so much data, it's ridiculous. Plus what, I have to bring a controller as well to connect my phone to? That's not fun. Also, the game lineup is just not powerful enough, man. Not enough exclusives, and at that, good exclusives. I know there are numerous people very against the idea of console exclusives, but exclusives drive people to other platforms. Exclusive promote competition. Competition means companies work to make their products better and more appealing, which means we get better products. And it's coming down to the fact that PlayStation has God of War, Stadia has Get Packed. This presentation didn't sell me on Stadia. It wasn't that bad, but well, wasn't exciting at all. Well, on to EA. Now, I had absolutely no expectations going into the Stadia event, so I refused to make predictions for it. But now we're finally into the real deal, the mainstay E3 presentations. So my predictions for EA Play 2019 is that I won't watch it. EA hosted their their thing on June 8th. It wasn't a part of E3, as per usual with EA. Now, they like to do their own thing during E3 called EA Play even though they hold it every year the day before Microsoft's E3 press conference and everybody just lumps it in with E3, so why not just participate in E3? But you know, EA's better than that. They can totally do their own stupid f***ing thing. Either way, EA didn't hold a traditional show this year and said they opted to hold a three hour long live stream talking about like six games. They started talking about Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order and it definitely looks like such a Star Wars game. Moved on to Apex Legends, a free to play game that's already out. Good to focus on that for half an hour. Battlefield 5, FIFA 20, Madden 20, and ending off with The Sims 4. I can't believe I'm saying this, I miss EA's 2018 show. At least with that, that was just an hour of stuff I didn't care about. Now I'm terrified of any video online with these three terms in the title. Three hours on these games. That's ridiculous. They should have at least put out a 20 minute video showing off gameplay or the trailers of the main things they were showcasing at EA Play this year, and then proceed to do this whole talk show thing for three hours. But no, the talk show thing was the entire show. That's stupid. Now I would love to spill the beans on my detailed thoughts on the whole three hour long live stream, but never in my life did I love not watching EA Play 2019 than during EA Play 2019. All I did was skim this thing and boom, we have an opinion. Three hours of interviews and BSing about six games in total, none of which are new titles we didn't know about. I shouldn't even rate this because EA wasn't acting like this was a for realsies press conference, and they were pretty upfront with letting us know this was exactly what we were getting. But that doesn't mean this was good, this was their E3 show this year, and judging it as an E3 show, they didn't show off anything of note except for Star Wars, they didn't show off anything new, and it was three hours long. This is gonna feel good. Microsoft is up next, and I predict that Phil Spencer doesn't exist. June 9th was the Xbox show, and this was a big one. With Sony not showing up, all eyes were on Microsoft. Everybody assumed, oh, since Sony's not there, all the third-party games will be shown off at Microsoft's conference. Plus, Microsoft and Nintendo were becoming way more buddy-buddy than usual with stuff like Cuphead coming to Switch. The people were speculating that maybe Nintendo would have some presence at the Xbox show. Maybe a Smash Brothers reveal for Blinks, who knows? Maybe Microsoft will come out on stage showing their brand new next-generation console. And all of these assumptions and more, are f***ing stupid. Here's Lego Forza. This is the Xbox E3 2019 briefing. 
I hope this announcer gets work outside of Microsoft's E3 every year. First game shown off is The Outer Worlds, that game by Obsidian revealed at the last Game Awards. A little weird this starts the show off. I mean, yeah, Obsidian became a Microsoft-owned studio late last year, but this game is still coming to PS4, so it's not like this big Xbox exclusive. Looks pretty good, though. It's like Obsidian said, well, fine, we'll make our own Fallout running away from Bethesda. Next up is Bleeding Edge by Ninja Theory. This one's really funky to me. Like, okay, Ninja Theory's a very talented studio, but they didn't really find their own voice until 2017 with Hellblade, and that was a heavily narrative-driven single-player experience, so their next game is a 4v4 multiplayer game. Not saying they can't do a game like this, but it's just weird that after Hellblade did so well, they do anything but Hellblade next. Ori and the Will of the Wisps, look at this game. I like this. I love how everything I've seen of Ori mixes together great looking gameplay with such amazing atmospheric storytelling. The animation is incredible here, and the first Ori game is something I really need to get to soon. The sequel is coming out in early 2020, almost three years after its announcement. Oh my god! Ooh, a brand new game from the creators of Minecraft! <laughs> Mafia 4! Minecraft Dungeons! Okay, it's a Minecraft dungeon crawler. It fits the IP well. It looks fine. Ha! <laughs> My patent just came in! Looks like I'm the official owner of the phrase, it looks fine now. It's a great phrase to use to describe games I don't care about, but don't want to piss anybody off with my opinion on them. We'll be hearing that a lot this show. Please welcome the head of Xbox, Phil Spencer. Damn it! Aw, oh, this guy. Phil Spencer's cool. I like him, but Jesus, there's this guy in the audience who tries to start a round of applause for everything he says. To be a significant unifying force for the world. Could you imagine if all E3 audiences were like this, just screaming at every little thing a presenter has to say no matter how unimpactful it is? Yeah, that would be ridiculous. Phil Spencer says, get this, we're gonna talk about 60 games. 50 of which will be shown in an indie game highlight reel. We'll be talking about our cloud gaming project and our new console. Here's EA Star Wars. A Jedi Fallen Order trailer, well, the old saying still remains true. You don't need a three hour long live stream to show people a new Star Wars game. It looks pretty good, but this pesky little thing won't come off. Blair Witch, that was unexpected. I love those trailers where you don't fully know what the game is until a good while into the trailer. And this one was one of those that made me go, Oh. Cyberpunk 2077 looks great. Now, to be fair, most of what we saw was just a cutscene. We've known about the first person perspective of the game for a while now, but it still catches me off guard. I don't know, I just feel like third person would suit this game more. Either way, it still looks really good. And it also looks really Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves cannibalized the memory anybody had of seeing the Blair Witch trailer. He overtook all conversations surrounding the Xbox presentation and he barely did anything. Still, it was really cool to see him, but my god, was that pretty much the only takeaway anybody had regarding this conference. Bleeding Edge, what the hell is that? Did you see Keanu? All right, next game. First thought, I was like, damn, they're making a game about Sagwa the Chinese cat, and then it turned out to be something I didn't know how to pronounce. Is this spirit far, fair, I don't know, it looks pretty. Battle Toads, hell yes, I was interested in seeing what came of this game. It was announced last year, but we finally got gameplay, and this is Battle Toads, all right. I'm a little mixed on the graphics. I do think they look exactly how they showed it. it. Makes this feel like a Saturday morning cartoon, and that's great, but the animation is a bit choppy. I wish it was a bit more fluid or had more spectacle to it all. I do like the new Turbo Tunnel. The fact that it's from a new perspective is a fun twist. It's nothing groundbreaking, but I think it's exactly what a modern Battle Toad should be. RPG Time The Legend of Riot. This is probably a bitch to play and to understand where you are and what's going on, but it looks really cool. I like the art style a lot. ID at Xbox, showing a metric 50 indie games. I remember absolutely none of these from the conference. Oh shit, Killer Queen Black is still not out? Some Xbox Game Pass talk, just some new titles coming and a new version of the program coming to PC. The Game Pass is neat. I got three months for a dollar and I'm loving every minute of barely spending money on DMC. You ever have one of those moments when you watch a trailer and jokingly say, Oh, <laughs> Microsoft Flight Simulator's coming back. And then, Oh shit. Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition. It looks fine. Wasteland 3. It looks fine. Xbox buys double fine. Well, I mean, I can understand that. Anybody ever play Happy Action Theater on the 360 for Kinect? That was a legitimately fun Kinect title published by Microsoft and Double Fine made it. Uh, come to think of it, most of their titles have been on Microsoft platforms and tonally they remind me a lot of Rare. So I think this is a good fit. Hopefully Double Fine doesn't go downhill like Rare did back when Microsoft first bought them. But I think with the current state of Xbox, I'd trust that they'll let Double Fine do what they want to do most of the time. 
we get a small trailer for Psychonauts 2, and it's starting to look really good. Like, in the world of crowdfunded games, this is visually fantastic. I'd be shocked if this falls into the camp of mediocrity that a lot of these long-awaited crowdfunded sequels squirm around in. A new LEGO Star Wars following the events of all nine films, that's really cool actually. Uh, Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, uh, it seems that Xbox is really into showing Dragon Ball Z related games each year now, and you know what? I'm just gonna say it. It looks fine. 12 minutes is interesting, so you're stuck in a time loop experiencing the same moment in your life right before somebody comes in and kills you, and I suppose you just do different things each time the world resets to alter the outcome ever so slightly. This is totally gonna be just a two hour long game. I'm interested to see how they shake things up with the same thing repeating over and over, but I think it has potential. It looks pretty cool. Way to the Woods. You remember those E3 games you don't remember? Yeah, that's Way to the Woods for me. I do not remember seeing this game during the presentation at all. Microsoft has so many of those types of games during the press conferences every year. They really go for a huge quantity of games, but a lot of them just don't leave an impression at all. I'm sorry, but a lot of the time with Microsoft's E3 shows, it feels like with the games they show, they'll take whatever trailers they get. Looking at it now, the game actually looks pretty good. I'm just saying, memorability is sort of a problem with a lot of the games at these shows. Gears 5 is confirmed to have faces, and no gameplay apparently, because most of this was just faces. They went under the stage for some reason, and then had some CG trailer for some multiplayer mode. Man, good for them. This game is coming out in September. Why are they barely showing gameplay? Are they just like, yeah, it's Gears of War, they know what it is. We could show gameplay, but let's build an underground lair. A new Xbox Elite controller, that's fun. I heard good things about the level, oh my god. Dying Light 2, yeah, that game's doing the whole existing thing. Now all of this is fine, but I just don't find any of this impressive unless they find a way to put a car on stage. I love video games. Forza Horizon 4 has this pretty cute looking Lego expansion, and the car they brought out on stage was full out Lego. Finally, a reason to play Forza. Gears pop for mobile devices. That came out of my mouth. Like I said, sometimes it feels like Microsoft will take any trailer they can get for E3. Why don't they show this? And even then, why did they not group this together with the Gears 5 trailer? Like, why didn't you play it after that? Also, this was shown last year at E3. Why have they shown the same mobile game at E3 two years in a row? State of Decay 2 expansion. I love State of Decay 1. I haven't played 2 yet, so this trailer doesn't really do much for me. I might give 2 a try sometime, though. Fantasy Star Online 2. It looks fine. Wait, that's actually kind of cool. This game has never been localized. I believe it was announced to come to the West years ago, but it never happened. So to see this finally come out over here is amazing, even if I'm not too interested in playing it. It's still awesome to see fans finally get to play this game in English. Except the Europeans, Sega thinks they hate Fantasy Star. Crossfire X, a PC legend with over 650 million players, comes to Xbox One. Where the hell was I when 650 million people played this? It seems to be more of a thing outside of the US, mainly Asian countries. I guess this is cool, but I mean, I don't know what the hell it is. Tales of Arise, Jesus Christ, that's beautiful. Borderlands 3 and New Borderlands 2 DLC, Elden Ring, a From Software George R. R. Martin collaboration, and finally, the big topics. Project xCloud and Microsoft's game streaming service. It didn't really go into much detail, but hey, Project Scarlet, the next generation Xbox is fully talked about. The main thing with Scarlet is that it's going to have drastically quicker load times and they fully committed to backwards compatibility with the Xbox One. I'm very happy about both of those things. It's just not crazy exciting at the moment. All it really proves is next E3 is probably going to be way more interesting. They show these graphics between people talking and I was like, oh man, this must be the console but super up close and then... Well, we officially know what the word Scarlet looks like now. Halo Infinite is revealed to be a cross-generation title coming to Xbox One and Scarlet at launch holiday 2020, and it gets a new trailer. No gameplay, but I really like the trailer. That was good. Nothing mind-blowing, nothing that left much of an impression outside of Keanu Reeves saying a few sentences, but nothing that was bad. I feel like we all kind of thought Microsoft's conference was going to be this huge thing, this monumental moment in gaming, Sony's out of the picture, so it's Xbox's time to shine. Nintendo's going to make an appearance and confirm some Xbox games on Switch or an Xbox character in Smash Brothers. Alright, after all this was said and done, I kind of realized the idea of Nintendo on Microsoft stage didn't make much sense. Like, Nintendo's not really supporting Xbox. Xbox is supporting Nintendo, so if anything, Microsoft would appear in a Nintendo Direct. Anyways, this felt like a very, very typical Xbox conference. The main few things I remembered were Cyberpunk and Halo Infinite. And nothing really left a huge impression outside of those two, and that made it a bit disappointing, though nothing was straight up bad at all. I'd say this was a solid conference by Microsoft, just nothing crazy. For Bethesda's conference, since I know it'll be bad, I predict they'll show nothing new but some loud f 
We'll eat it up. It must be tough being Bethesda, releasing a bad video game and people criticize you for it. God, that must be the worst. June 9th, a couple hours after Microsoft's conference, Bethesda took the stage and started off with the usual, a heartfelt video saying how deep down, we're all Bethesda. I feel like Bethesda really wants people to not consider them as big of a publisher as they really are. Like they do all these things to make it feel like they're doing things for the fans and they're super down to earth. But in reality, they're pretty much another Activision in my eyes. So Todd Howard comes out, makes a quip about Fallout 76 not being good. Elder Scrolls Blades, that mobile game is talked about and gets announced for Switch. The audience fucking loses it. Oh my god, a mobile game is coming to Switch. It's every man's dream. I'm sorry, this is such lame Switch support. I'd rather take Fallout 3 or Oblivion or something, not a port of a mobile game. Some updates to Fallout 76, including yeah, we put a battle royale in Fallout 76. Oh, he said f he's one of us. And NPCs are getting added to the game. Oh, it's like an actual video game now. Todd Howard comes back out and confirms, hey, we're working on those games we confirmed last year. Shinji Mikami comes out and announces a new game, Ghostwire Tokyo, hands it off to Akumi Nakamura to discuss it a bit. I can confirm, she's adorable. So no gameplay, but color me intrigued, I'm interested to see more. That's it. That's literally all I can say. They show no gameplay. What do you want me to say? Toot the noodles. A video plays of people talking about their Bethesda experiences. This guy comes out and people just go off. People start screaming after everything he says. I'm just sitting here like, man, this guy's just talking about Elder Scrolls Online. Literally, this audience freaks out over anything. Like, Todd Howard could come back on stage. Hey, everybody, it's Todd Howard. I'm an arsonist. Yeah! He talks about Elder Scrolls Online or something. Uh, people were cheering. I don't know. At this point, I was outside looking for moles. A new Commander Keen is announced. For mobile devices, Jesus Christ. I feel like if this was a $10 downloadable game on PS4, Xbox One, and Switch, it would do fairly well. I think the fact that this is a mobile game just confirmed everybody watching this presentation has no interest in it anymore. Choose from a caboodle of contraptions to conquer challenges. And try saying that five times fast. The twins go on adventure. The fact people laughed at that joke confirms the audience was paid to applaud everything. Like, if they made that joke at the Xbox conference seven years ago, nobody would flinch. Elder Scrolls Legends, oh my god, who cares? So you could experience the Elder Scrolls in a new way. Rage 2 update, Wolfenstein Youngblood and Cyberpilot coming soon. Yeah, we know. Wolfenstein Youngblood. Words, words, he said words! A new game by Arcane, Deathloop. Okay, no gameplay, cool. Another video, something about game streaming. You don't even know what it is, stop screaming! So it's just a software solution to optimize games for streaming. Okay, cool. You can sign up for the Slayers Club to stream Doom 2016 for free. Everybody could use a little more Doom in their lives. What the hell is wrong with you? It's Doom 2016. If you're screeching about it this much, then you've obviously already played it. So why are you freaking out about being able to play it again for free? Why? Finally, we end things off with Doom Eternal. It looks fantastic. I really enjoyed Doom 2016, and this looks like it's bringing back that same adrenaline rush-infused gameplay. I love it. Our totally new Doom multiplayer experience. We call it Battle Mode. You're gonna freak out about Doom 2016, but then you get hesitant applause for multiplayer? Once I think I figure out this crowd, they do this to me. Bethesda at E3 2019. I really hope I never have to use those two things in a sentence ever again. What the hell happened here? Not only was this conference flooded by some guy screaming at almost every sentence the presenter said, interrupting them and making the conference like four hours longer than it was intended to be, but Bethesda didn't really show anything. Like, the games they announced were either, who the hell cares, no gameplay shown, games we already knew about, games that are there at every E3 for Bethesda, or Doom Eternal, which looks fantastic, but I was already sold on it, so whatever. The audience was acting like they've never seen anything like this before. Garbage. Doom Eternal looks great, but I don't care. It wasn't enough to save this thing for me. I predict Ubisoft will announce something other than a new Tom Clancy game. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's speed through Ubisoft show because there's gonna be a whole lot of it looks fines from me and it just ain't worth it. June 10th, it all started with an Assassin's Creed symphony. Nice music, but I wouldn't go to one of their live performances. I couldn't care less about Assassin's Creed music. It's not iconic like Zelda music, for example. That's why something like the Zelda symphony worked way better in my opinion. But who knows, that could just be the stupid Nintendo fan of me saying that. Watch Dogs Legion! Watch Dogs is pretty decent, and this looks like more Watch Dogs. I do like the idea of being able to control multiple characters, that's pretty cool. A new TV show by the Always Sunny Guys. 
Why is this at E3? Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. It looks fine. Adventure Time in Brawlhalla. It looks fine. Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Breakpoint. It looks fine. Tom Clancy's Elite Squad. It looks dumb. Just Dance 2020 for the Wii. Not the Wii U, PS3 or 360, but the Wii. I love that. For Honor update. It looks fine. Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Quarantine. It looks fine. Tom Clancy's The Division 2 update. Does anybody know who Tom Clancy is anymore? Jesus Christ, nearly half the games shown here are Tom Clancy games. Jesus, this is brutal. Uplay Plus, a Ubisoft subscription service. Oh my God. I'm really tired of companies thinking their shit doesn't stink and they can make their own subscription service. Like when companies say, man, we don't need to put our stuff on Netflix. People will pay for our own streaming service. I'm sorry, but who thinks this is a good deal? Nearly all of these games are stupidly cheap now. Why would I pay $15 a month for Rayman Origins and Uno? Who's gonna say, damn, I wanna play Ubisoft games and only Ubisoft games, but I don't wanna own them. I'll pay for a Ubisoft subscription service. I just don't see the point. Roller Champions, all right, a Ubisoft Rocket League. It looks like it could be fun. And Gods and Monsters, a game that legitimately has a very nice art style but I don't know what the game plays like, oh my god. That stunk, that wasn't great. I think it was better than Bethesda in terms of just having new games there and being less annoying. But to be honest, the screaming dude at Bethesda at least made a terrible conference sort of funny. I think Ubisoft was slightly better, but barely. No Sony this year, but Square Enix hosted their own press conference around the same time Sony does on June 10th. And I predict everybody will say they loved Square Enix's presentation just because they show the Final Fantasy VII Remake. And oh boy did they! This game looks incredible! I'm actually interested in a Final Fantasy game! And then they proceed to tell us about a game that's already out! Damn it! To be fair, a new episode is on its way for Life is Strange 2. They're not the best way to move forward after such an amazing introduction. Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Remastered. This was announced almost a year ago. When is this coming out? Winter? What the hell? How is this coming out over a year after it got announced? The Last Remnant Remastered, available now on Switch. That would have been a crazy announcement if I knew what The Last Remnant was. Octopath Traveler on PC, okay, cool. A Dragon Quest Builders 2, all right, yeah, you know, it's coming soon. A Dragon Quest 11 on Switch, oh my god, this is a game from 2017. This isn't interesting. This looks very good on Switch, but this is an old game, and we already saw all of the improvements in this version in a previous Nintendo Direct. Both 11 and Builders 2's trailer just felt needlessly long to me. I was just like, yeah, I get it. Especially with 11s, considering, you know, people can play Dragon Quest XI right now. Circuit Superstars and Battalion 1944. Okay, these were some of the most forgettable games shown off at E3. I have to give them that. Square Enix music now available to stream. Yeah, that happened before this conference. Nothing new here. Kingdom Hearts 3 DLC, Final Fantasy XIV update, Dying Light 2, Romancing Saga 3, and Scarlet Grace coming to the West. That's pretty cool. Final Fantasy Brave Exvius. Jesus, what the hell is up with companies showing mobile games during their press conference? conferences this year. Outriders, done by People Can Fly. You know, I really enjoyed Bulletstorm, but this game does nothing for me so far. I I just don't really care. Oninaki. It looks fine. Final Fantasy VIII is finally getting a re-release. That's awesome. I think the source code for this game was lost, so it's great to see it actually resurface. And the Avengers game by Crystal Dynamics is finally shown off. This was announced years ago, and hey, they're finally confident in showing showing some cutscenes. They spliced in like four seconds of gameplay, but that was it. I really want to be excited for this. I want more Marvel games as fun and well-made as Spider-Man PS4. And while I think the story may be on par with Spider-Man, I mean, that game was really fun to play. And I have no idea what this game plays like. I love Crystal Dynamics, and while this reveal was entertaining, I'm just not super on board with this game quite yet. That was okay, uh, FF7 looks fantastic, and I'm looking forward to seeing more from Avengers, but there was not much in between. A lot of stuff we already knew about, a lot of stuff that wasn't interesting. I think people were praising this conference simply because FF7, and because it was way better than the other shows so far. It wasn't too bad, but after the beginning, not much was really that wild. Like, it's cool Final Fantasy VIII finally gets re-released, but overall, it was just fine. Well, 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 what do we have here? The company I have the most embarrassing feelings towards. Uh, well, that means I have the most predictions for Nintendo at E3 2019, uh, like Metroid Prime 5. The GameCube games will finally come to Wii U Virtual Console. The DLC for Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games on Wii U. A photo emerges of Shigeru Miyamoto looking completely lost in the Epic Games booth. Uh, Doug Bowser proves his worth as the new Nintendo of America president by eating an entire ice cream sandwich in one bite on Treehouse Live. 
Bill Trennan is visibly impressed. I didn't have the highest expectations of this year for Nintendo. I was just hoping to be entertained. Uh, there were enough games that we knew about heading into E3 that I just wanted to see more on. Link's Awakening, Luigi's Mansion 3, finally seeing Animal Crossing, a new Smash Brothers DLC character, come on. Just getting all those plus two or three brand new games, I'd be content with that. We start things off with the new Smash Brothers DLC character, this being... Damn it. All right, so the hero from Dragon Quest XI makes his way into Smash Brothers. I'm perfectly fine with Dragon Quest representation in Smash. I think the series is beloved, respected, influenced countless franchises, and is pretty much the de facto JRPG series next to Final Fantasy. I think it just makes sense for Dragon Quest to get a character in Smash Brothers. But after we got the mind f of Joker from Persona 5 as the first DLC character, I was kind of expecting something a little wilder than Dragon Quest. The hero is one of the driest possible DLC picks they could have made. I'm happy he's in, but it's not this thing where, oh my god, who could have predicted this? Everybody was saying Erdrick from Dragon Quest 3 was going to be the pick for Smash Brothers, but no, the default costume is the Luminary from Eleven, and then the various other protagonists throughout the series are alternate costumes, including Erdrick. Like I said, I'm cool with the Dragon Quest character, it's just not that exciting. We immediately go into, oh come on, how many damn times do I have to watch a trailer for a game that's been out since 2017? Yoshiaki Koizumi is here alongside Doug Bowser's first appearance in a Nintendo Direct as president of NOA. Uh, they make a little joke about his last name being Bowser, I like that. And we move into Luigi's Mansion 3, holy sh**. This looks way better now! After seeing it at E3, I'm legitimately excited about 3. The first trailer just didn't look that great, but now, the lighting, the shadows, the color, the textures, the detail, everything just reeks of polish. This looks like a game from 2019, and the new gameplay mechanics they detailed look stupid enjoyable. The slamming a ghost around, using Gooigi to get past obstacles, great stuff. It's also nice to see a lot more characters with personality and unique designs compared to Dark Moon. Luigi's Mansion 3, is legitimately looking incredibly promising so far. Now I know what you're saying. Luigi's Mansion 3 looks pretty good, but I want a tactical game based on Jim Henson's Dark Crystal. What the hell is wrong with you? I have no idea why they decided to showcase this game. It's based off of a Netflix series, based off of this cult classic movie from the 80s. It looks okay, but why they show this, I just don't really get. The Link's Awakening remake looks precious. I'm so pumped to play this. I loved what I played with the original, and I can't wait to just fiddle around with this game. It's so beautiful. The music is fantastic. And while it seems to be an incredibly faithful remake, they're doing some interesting new stuff, like remixing your own dungeon. Trials of Mana is getting a remake. Now, if you're like me, you probably asked, what the hell is a Trials of Mana? I thought this was a new Mana game at first, but no, this is a full 3D remake of Seiken Densetsu 3, the sequel to Secret of Mana we never Ever got outside of Japan. And that fully set in when they revealed the collection of mana featuring the original Trials of Mana is getting localized here. That is huge! I am very happy about that. Not only can people outside of Japan finally play Seiken Densetsu 3 in English, but it's remade as well, and it looks a hell of a lot better than the Secret of Mana remake. I refuse to play The Witcher 3 in anything above 720p, so The Witcher 3 Complete Edition on Switch was a nice announcement. Oh really, I'm super happy to see such a huge open world game come to Switch, especially when it's only a couple of years old. From the gameplay footage, I've seen, it's obviously graphically downgraded, but it still looks pretty tolerable. And the fact they were able to squish this entire thing on a Switch game card is the feel-good story of the year. Meanwhile, at Capcom, they couldn't fit two Resident Evil games from the early 2000s on one card. Fire Emblem Three Houses, no gameplay, it comes out in a month and a half, say it with me now. It looks fine. So they build up this Resident Evil trailer, uh, these people are playing the Resident Evil 1 remake, which is already available to play on Switch in a spooky house for about a minute, and then they reveal Resident Evil 5 and 6 for the system. There are multiple things I just don't understand here. Uh, why was this a commercial for Resident Evil 1 and then they say, hey, 5 and 6 are coming? Plus, this feels like a weird thing to highlight in the big E3 presentation. The fact that two old Resident Evil games are coming to the system, especially 5 and 6. Uh, 5 is generally well received, while 6 is Resident Evil 6. Really confusing, especially considering Capcom just kind of announced RE1, 0, and 4 on their own time with no Nintendo Direct, but then 5 and 6 are announced at E3. That's just weird to me. Next trailer plays, it looks like Astral Chain or something. Uh, what the hell? All right, no more Heroes 3. Hell yeah, what a reveal. Contra Rogue Corpse. I gotta be honest, this looks like garbage. It's been almost a decade since the last Contra game, and the first one since then is a 3D overhead shooter. Yeah, that's what people wanted. At least Contra Anniversary Collection was thrown on the eShop right after the Direct. Uh, Damon X Machina, this game has been a part of what? Like, four Nintendo Directs at this point, and how many people do you hear not talking about it? Well, to answer that question, I looked up the population of the world. A Panzer Dragoon remake, it actually looks really nice. I have no idea why my first thought was, f they're bringing back Lair? And then two seconds later, I was like, oh yeah, it's Panzer Dragoon. Jeez. 
Jesus. Either way, it's good to see this back. Pokemon Sword and Shield. We got info about these games a week before E3. I hate when Nintendo wastes time on games they already talked about elsewhere. Next game. Astro Chain, looking pretty solid. I enjoy Platinum games from time to time. I'm not as invested into them as a lot of other people are, but I will say, this is looking pretty slick. Empire of Sin, watch any live reaction to this Nintendo Direct and everybody does the same thing. Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. It looks fine. Actually, no, I'm fine with saying, I don't think this game looks all too great. It looks really low budget and nothing special. It looks like a Wii game. It's cool that Nintendo resurrected the series, but it baffles me that they decided to put time and effort into resurrecting this series out of all series. Guinness of Hyrule gets a release date of right after E3. I'm eager to try this out, a rhythm adventure game in the Zelda universe. I definitely want to give the original Crypt of the Necro Dancer a go as well. Mario and Sonic at the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games actually looks pretty good. The Wii U entries were garbage, who cares, but this one looks like they put some solid DLC into it and I'm digging what I'm seeing so far. And then finally, after waiting for over a decade, we get to see a traditional new Animal Crossing on a home console, f this. Yeah, it got delayed to 2020, but Animal Crossing New Horizons looks really damn good. They're actively changing a fair amount of stuff with the series, but not in bad ways. They're adding things people have been begging for for ages, and honestly, I think I can wait till March to play this. It'll probably be worth the wait. A bit of a sizzle reel showing a bunch of Switch titles coming soon. Spyro Reignited Trilogy, Alien Isolation, Nino Kuni, Super Lucky's Tale, what? Okay, we're getting another Smash Brothers reveal. Uh, this is a reprise of the King K. Rule trailer. I assume this is gonna be like Dixie Con or something. Ah! 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 Holy sh! Banjo Kazooie is in Smash Brothers. This is amazing! A Microsoft characters in Smash Brothers. Everybody was speculating three Microsoft characters: Steve from Minecraft, Master Chief, or Banjo Kazooie. I would have been fine with any of them. I'm definitely more into Banjo out of all these franchises, but I was personally rooting for Master Chief just because he's the Xbox guy. So while Banjo Kazooie would have made me happier, Master Chief would have been like this insane gaming moment. Banjo is kind of more of an us Nintendo fans thing, but. God, I'm so happy. This was such an incredible moment. Banjo and Kazooie look so damn good. I keep re-watching this trailer. It's so nice to see these characters back on a Nintendo console. I hope this means we get stuff like a new Banjo game, but this alone is just beautiful. They could have ended right there, but oh my god. I mean, of course they were gonna make a sequel to Breath of the Wild, but I was expecting if it was ever going to happen, they were going to announce it in 2020, but here we are. Breath of the Wild is one of my favorite games of all time. I'm very excited. Look, potentially Ganondorf's rotting body. This is the best. So yeah, Nintendo definitely won E3. Uh, the middle of the Direct definitely dragged a bit with your Damon X Machinas, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3's Fire Emblem Three Houses, that game nobody saw any value in, but it started and ended way too strong to give it anything below a three. In fact, I'm feeling generous. It gets an extra point for this, this, and this. That was a bad E3. Nintendo was good, Microsoft was okay, but without Sony, it really felt like something was missing here. People always say how E3 is dying and companies don't take it as seriously anymore. And while I feel like statements like that are exaggerated a bit, this year definitely made the old E3 is dying suspicion feel more true than ever. I hope it's just because Microsoft and Sony are preparing to go into the next generation, but regardless, man, this E3 was pretty raw. Hopefully E3 2020, uh, more companies don't drop out. Because worst case scenario, we'll just have Microsoft, uh, Ubisoft, and like, DiGiorno.